So, uh, I'll throw in one little, one little thing, right? Is the idea of like, uh, sticking to something you like, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. Like, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But you're, the thing that you think is not broke is never the same. And that creates a paradox. Like someone says like, well, you know, I've been doing this for the last 30 years. Well, you've been doing this the last 30 years differently. It might not seem like it's different because you're not focused on seeing the differences. You're focused on preserving the similarities. This is the one, you know, I've been an engineer for 30 years and I've done this, the same thing for 30 years. It's a tried and, you know, tried, tested, uh, standard that kept me successful all your life. It has changed. Momentarily. Little by little. Little changes over time are less apparent to someone who's not looking for them. You have 30 years of experience that cumulatively change your way of doing the thing that you focus on preserving being the same. There are very few people on this planet that has their brain biologically somehow have the capacity to remember even... It would be pretty impressive actually to remember 30 years of identical repetition. I I honestly think it would be impressive for someone to do something I live two days identically. Can you possibly even live two days identically? I would love to see that. What that looks like. A video game? Possibly. Like it's the closest thing. Like a closed system is Possibly the closest thing you can get to rep repetitiously doing something near identically. But anything you, uh, any more dynamics than that, and even a video game is very difficult to know because you won't feel the same every single day. There's a, there's a hand wavy generalization of how you feel. So today, to wrap it up, this little digression. Um, it's the eighth week of Spelljammer, and it might seem like I'm doing the same thing, but obviously I'm not, right? And I choose not to make it the same. And you, most people, can also choose to do so as well. Is it overall going to increase your happiness and your consistency in your life. I like to believe that, but I'm not selling life hacks here. I'm just talking about observations. Uh, it is up to the person or the stranger or myself, my future self, to, de to determine if there's something special there. And one day I'll look back and think to myself, well, I can't possibly understand everything that I was going for in this digression because I didn't clearly didn't express everything that's going on in my head but you know what I like to believe my future self is going to think yeah there's definitely some merit to my to the stranger's uh, perspective on on the dynamics of memory and how it uh, affects our decision making or you know Pretty much everything else, right? Because the learning process involves encoding new memory and then using that memory to develop skills that pretty much shape everything we do. So this goes back to that little little jab about uh Thanks Lake House. This goes uh, 
towards that uh, jab about how someone loves a story like say you love your grandfather's story they he sits down with you at night you're about to go to bed you're just a wee little young young lad right and your grandfather tells you his story for the first time it was fantastic it was filled with adventure and you were enamored fast forward 10 years your grandfather wants to tell you the story again but this time for the 100th time do you enjoy it again do you think it's the same how do you feel about it maybe you find it boring right now you find it boring the idea is you can probably find it boring and because it's boring it can become interesting again what i'm saying is if you know your grandfather's story is going to be boring now that you've heard it a hundred times ask your grandfather for more details contribute to the storytelling your grandfather is just as dynamic as you are so when the story involves you the telling of that story can be dynamic as well now let's just say if i was the grand if i ended up in my old age my stories change every time they are told like they're slightly changed every time and what i mean by that is we're not talking about the generalized semantics like oh yeah you know this is when i went to buy bread well it's going to be about when i bought bread but my feelings about it will change over time. Like one day I'm going to be emphasizing one part of the story. And another day I'm going to be emphasizing a different side of the story. I am not trying to tell the story the same way every single time. I'm embracing, I'm embracing my humanity and understanding that the people I'm listening to will also find it very interesting to expressively storytell. And that's kind of the difference, in my opinion, between someone who is creatively storytelling and incredibly expressive than someone who's trying to be mechanical and robotic about it. It's, it's great for science, right? It's great for science when you're solving, like, mechanical things and whatnot and repetitious things it's different when you're sapping the life out of your own stories about your own life so i've had this conversation a couple of times it happens a lot when i ask someone hey you know merry christmas brent what you do today like how's your holidays going and the first comment the most consistent comment that I got was, oh, you know, we did the same, th we do the same thing. Nothing really special. It's, it's the usual thing. We talk with family. It's like, oh, that sounds pretty special. Like, nah, you know, we do it all the same. It's like, well, it's not all the same to me. And then even if it is all the same to that person, that's what I'm talking about. The whole preservation thing. The focus is on what is the same. So it dulls the need to be expressively sharing about it. It's an extension of what I'm saying, where when you enter a routine, it also saps the life out of your routine. And it's a human condition. When you do something repetitiously, it becomes less intellectually stimulating. And then what happens is you project that disinterest. As in, oh yeah, you know, Today, like, if, if I were to describe someone what I was doing today, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm doing the eighth week of Spelljammer, right? And I said earlier and kind of projected this, um, this interest, like, oh, yeah, you know, nothing has changed and stuff. So how do I change it up? <clears throat> well, I s talked about the facts. No patch notes. Talked about some of the changes, like, the... Uh, the changes that I noticed, I brought a story with me. I brought an idea with me. It's not the same. 
and I now I quite literally probably spent two hours digressing about this and now it's different <clears throat> if it is the same well I'm not gonna let it stay the same although video games again is a great ex it's the closest thing that can be repetitiously reproduced but you're a human being right I'm a human being playing a game what can I contribute or what can I make it feel significant and not a waste of time? If you're going around telling people that you're just doing the same old, same old, and, or at least not people like people like me, if you come up to me and tell me like, Hey, how are you? And then I ask you, how are you? And you just said like, ah, you know, I just got this out of the way. And, uh, today I had to do the same old grind and stuff. I'm worried about you. In my opinion like that's not and you bet if you were to tell me that i'm going to ask you a question i'm going to not so subtly almost not really gaslight but compliment how much you accomplish each day it's to encourage the person to not get not get stale and stagnate with their life because again my one digression that I really highlight on my channel is the dangers of boredom when you get to that state you not only feel bored not want to learn anything not look forward to other things you also project boredom so then people become less interested in you. People drift away from you. You stop practicing being expressive. And it's really a big part of your life. So when you be if you are bored with your life, how can you possibly get other people to be interested in your life? Well, you hope you're lucky and that someone captures the moment for you. And video games kind of do that. It offsets that. So it's great that we have these things. It's even greater and more powerful if you can do it whenever you want. Right? Like you don't have to be dependent on a video game to make your life sound fantastic. Um, you can also get lucky and bump into someone like me who really just thinks everyone has fantastic lives to begin with. But what are the chances of that happening? Well... I can tell you, if you're looking at a Twitch streamer, that's very unlikely to happen. Especially a popular one, right? So, I'm gonna say that I'm not statistically likely to happen. So, you're not gonna get someone who's gonna go out of their way to convince you that your life is interesting. You have to convince them that your life is interesting. And when you convince, if you're able to convince other people that your life is interesting, you might actually believe that your life is interesting. And what does that do for you? It makes you really love life. If it's already hard enough to tell someone who doesn't even know what's going on in your life that your life is interesting, that just tells me that this person is starting to get into a pattern that really doesn't value their own life and i don't want to see in my opinion yeah if you're 60 years old or 70 years old okay i will concede if you have closure in your life you don't necessarily have to keep being excited about your life you might have enough excitement for a lifetime right like you're over it you got it fair enough when i'm playing video games i don't talk i don't usually talk to 60 year olds and 70 year olds I usually encounter like 18 year olds and they're nihilistic as heck. Like if they're not nihilistic now, they show most of the signs of being nihilistic as in, uh, you know, like uh, life, you know, life goes on. Like it's Christmas again. Yeah. You know, we just do the same thing. We buy a gift and, you know, hang out with families like, man, Man, that sounds lovely. That's my first response most of the time, right? That sounds lovely. Tell me about it. Tell me about what you did. 
what you talk to your family about. And then, you know, sometimes it can be too personal and you'll be like, don't, you know, if you can't share it, that's, that's fine. Tell me how it made you feel. Like, you don't have to be specific about it. The idea is to encourage kids to be either acknowledging what they're doing or finding meaning in what they're doing. I literally had someone tell me online, it's there by the way, it's recorded, that someone told me that, hey, you know, this entire group of people who has this hobby that ranges up to millions of people, millions of kids, are just young kids who don't need to understand they can find meaning in things that don't have meaning. Like, that guy is someone I encountered. Like, well, if you go around thinking that about other people, man, I can't imagine what it's like to live inside the person's head. Where they have to go around and make other people's passions and stuff insignificant to them by passing it off as a gaslight. I, yeah, sure. I, I I respect that you don't think it has a meaning, right? It doesn't have a meaning. That's fair. All the power to you. Well, to your perspective, I'm producing a meaning where there isn't one. Can you do that? Because it doesn't look like you can. So one day, you're going to find that your life is dull and all you do is go around and try to rain on other people's parade and you can't even find satisfaction for your own significance. So, whether or not that person was trying to be harmful or not, I'm not concerned with that. I'm more concerned for the person's well-being because if a million people are playing a video game and you're suggesting it's not significant, it doesn't have any meaning, especially problem solving, then you're really out of touch with reality. I mean, there are less people playing Neverwinter, for example. It wasn't about Neverwinter, though. No. Um, I wish everyone to find significance. I mean, that also implies that I hope that people who are malicious, right? Here's the, here's, here's a very big caveat here. But are you, you know, someone could challenge me and say, are you saying also like those bullies and like criminals and stuff need to find significance in what they're doing too? Like, well, they're humans. If they manage to find significance in other things, imagine if that, what led to that person's act of desperation. It's a more of a chicken or the egg question now. If this person, if that criminal or that person, that troll, or what have you, were cyberbullying, if they found and enabled themselves to find significance in other things, would they have been? Would they have become a cyberbully in the first place? If they, if their lives is filled with significant moments and whatnot, it's a thought experiment. Obviously, I can't make a claim one way or the other. Someone may say, you know, some people are just born evil, and I'm like, okay, I can't do anything about that, right? That is that person's firm belief. That's fair. To me, since I've already presented this idea of dynamics, right? Uh, the biology suggests that humans are dynamic. And that goes against a lot of things that people hold on dearly, like the nature of a person doesn't change right that that type of perspective and the traditional conventional knowledge like oh yeah uh, people are if rotten people are always rotten people it's a very touchy subject and i respect that those individuals who have experienced trauma have held on to those trauma or those people have experienced something that selectively cause them to hold on to certain memories a lot, like really vividly, and they have my sympathy. I just live in a naive world, I guess, a very naive idealistic world, the perspective that the person who has trauma 
can eventually develop faith in that rotten people can be great people, damaged people can become healed people, and that in an ideal world, both the both parties get to find sustainability and significance in their life. It's not one or the other. I'm not picking sides. I am just living an idealistic and naive perspective that both parties can end up being happy in some way. It's naive. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm absolutely willing to accept that naive premise. Obviously, if I can accept that it's naive, that means that I have a realistic perspective that makes that not a possibility. I just keep it in the back of my head though. I always want to believe in something, but not necessarily accept that it is true. I don't accept that it is feasible a lot of times. I like to believe it though. So I can stay grounded with the realities of things while being hopeful at the same time. And that's usually where I end up sounding wishy-washy and it's like, well, then that means you don't have conviction and you don't believe in the good nature of people or you believe people are ever-changing and uh, vitriolic. Is that the word I'm looking for? You know, very fickle, I guess. You know, that, that stuff. Like, well, all of the above. All of the above. Just to exchange conversation with myself, I suppose. And for those who may listen in the future, I... It sounds really sappy because I am openly a sappy person. Not a... Not a... You know, again, I, I've talked about this before. I'm not a thin-skinned person. I'm just sappy. Like, I'm horrendously sappy when it comes to these things. Uh... But yeah, you can... You know, mo most people take it as a... I'm not inviting controversy. Either. Like, I don't want to invite controversy. I just want to know that if someone disagrees with me, I hope they're happy. <laughs> like... If... If insulting me... Uh, gives them value and reinforces their uh, convictions, then that's fine. It doesn't really hurt me that much. I, I, I don't think it hurts me. It actually might act motivate me, inspire me to uh, look for new ways of presenting ideas. That's what happened this week, by the way. Like, you know, it's getting... Uh, the next time we play Neverwinter is going to be after the New Year's. Right, so this is effectively, right, the 26th, six days from now. Yeah, it's going to be after New Year's. Um, this is effectively my reflection on this year. I don't usually uh, do, uh, maybe in the future if people are interested, but I don't usually do like yearly reviews or something because I naturally do reviews every time I do projects. So. Like, in another two reset days, I will be reviewing Spelljammer. Like, not reviewing the sense of, like, game journalism and stuff. Uh, objective reviews, you can find objective... You can find reviews that are trying to be objective anywhere. Like, that's, that's plenty. I'm not... I generally don't talk about objectivity. My... Uh, I spend most of my life in objectivity, and I certainly could appreciate what it's like to aim to be objective. Nowadays, I think there's less and less appreciation for what could be for someone versus what is for someone. Like, this game is not for you because of X, Y, and Z. Well, those are facts. The interpretation is not objective. However, it's passed off as being objective. I have no concerns of telling you that I do not have factual 
or any evidential ways to support what I'm saying. The idea is that these are experiences. In fact, if I told you a fact, here's a fact, right? To relate to what I've been digressing about today. If I told you a fact, that fact might not be the same the next day. Because facts are based on people's memories. Facts are, you need to record it and read it again. <coughs> However, tenuously, when you're remembering those things, you're going to use them for different things. Like you're going to interpret them differently from day to day. Like it's going to change relatively. Like one day, the fact that you have is probably non-changing, but your opinion about the fact, your interpretation and your mood and how you use it or are going to apply it is going to change based on your mood. Because you're just human. And it's great. It's... It's kind of, uh, we live in a time where there's hyper op uh, objectivity, like a uh, hyper reliant on trying to be objective when you're reviewing things. Let's just take a step back and think about how oxymoronic that comment is. You're going to spend all your efforts to trying to review a product, like a creative product. We're specifically talking about video games. There are extraneous, extraneous circumstances, like buying six hot dogs versus buying eight of the same hot dogs. There, there are objective ways, you know, to compare those things. Um, we're talking about how much video games appeal to someone, right? Think about how oxymoronic that sounds. You are going to objectively review a game so that other people can make an objective decision on whether they're going to like or dislike a game. The hyper objectification of psychological behavior and preferences is a symptom in my opinion of how youtube algorithm and you know like the automation process works yes automation is great it creates consistency i'm all for that i'm just talking about the philosophy of this like you are trying to objectify how much people are going to like or dislike something? I thought, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I might need to say that again one more time, right? You are going to objectify something that is inherently subjective and try to present it as object, objective while subjectively presenting your interpretation. So it, it's a little weird. I know I said a bunch of words a couple times back and forth to make it sound confusing, but it is confusing, at least to me. So you're trying to objectively, or you're trying to subjectively present your objective argument about people's subjectivity. That's bold. And, um, you know, you know why there are like 8 billion reviewers and critics and whatnot? It's because it's inherently inconsistent. And that's kind of part of the charm, in my opinion. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's actually very charming. Like, think about it. When you read a review, what is the charm of trying to read someone's subjective interpretations of objective metrics? It's an exercise in futility. But here's a spin on it. It's also an opportunity to get to know someone and form a parasocial relationship with people you desire to have a parasocial relationship with. You can learn about that person through their peace. So instead of focusing on the value of that particular review, you can discern if this person has similar perspective 
that you do. So in the future, that parasocial relationship that you have with this person can be reliable indicator of something that will save you decision making. I've already used an example like that today. Hank Green and John Green. I feel that I have a sufficient understanding of them that when they suggest something and interpret something, right? I am probably consistently likely to do the same thing too. So when they raise interest in something, then I will naturally be interested in that thing too. And that's kind of what the YouTube algorithm is trying to do, right? However, it's based on you. So, and then it enables you to need to have the skills to do that in return. So what the YouTube algorithm is removing is that process, the process of looking to see if this person really is for you. Null hypothesis testing. When an algorithm suggests a video to you, do you ever ask if this video is appropriate for you? Or in what nature is this uh, concordant with your interest, right? So a lot of times people just don't ask, they just click. And then let the person behind the frame convince you that it's important, right? So you don't need to work hard or put in extra effort to determine a null hypothesis test. When I see YouTube recommend things algorithmically to me, I ask myself, hmm, do I really find this stuff interesting? Or is it interesting because I just see a lot of it because the algorithm is telling me, uh, it is mere exposing me to it, right? That kind of thing. It's like walking out the door, right? Or visiting a cultural hub, like visiting New York City. You're going to be exposed to things that you ask that question to yourself. On the internet though, it's usually based on statistical parameters. And those things are likely to already have convinced you. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, you looked up a lot of bunny videos. So here's more bunny videos. So it's distilled to the point where well, you don't really ask yourself that question very often. Therefore, you don't practice that anymore. Uh, what is a great trade-off of this? Becoming poorer and poorer judge of character. Because if you don't practice it in parasocial relationships, <clears throat> what happens when you practice? What happens when you actually go out to form a relationship? Well, you haven't practiced it. So what do we have? Here's a deep cut that I'm not going to go into just as a primer. You have younger generation of people who think that relationships and compromises and communication should be as easy as the algorithm matching you up. There's no compromises, no learning to love one another, no I can learn something from you, you can learn something from me. It's more why isn't this easy and just work out on its own because there's a rating system or some sort of metric that brings two people together. And a lot of times, you know, I try to counter this by saying, hey, I fell in love with things that I didn't even know I wanted. I developed skills that I clearly didn't go out of my way to do in the first place. There's no randomness. So how is this important? When your life requires randomness, that is why it's important. What is a great time to practice these things? And this is was this was the theme of my week of digressions. When is it a great time, logically speaking, we're not talking about emotional stuff now, logically speaking, what is a great time to practice 
or life-changing decisions. When they're trivial. So what is a great time to practice being a better judge of character? When you're watching that influencer and challenging yourself if that influence if you how much you know about that influencer through their content. Because like if you get it wrong or you did something and you misunderstood them, it's a parasocial relationship. It's one-sided. They don't even know you exist. Yet. Right? So it hasn't become serious yet. That's a perfect time to practice skills that can't possibly harm you at the moment. It, get, it might harm your pride a little and, you know, like, it might get you down a little. It's not going to ruin two people's relationships with each other, like literal relationships. So video games is a great place to do that. If that was a theme. No. A game might not be like super hardcore frontal lobe activation for problem solving and critical thinking. And that's the whole point. You use video games to practice these things. The, la the last thing you want to do is make a la life and death situation like life and death decision after not practicing making decisions for a really long time. It's the difference between being responsible of getting into a car under the influence than not. A person who has made lots of quote-unquote self-imposed significant decisions while doing other things like playing video games or what you have for lunch will treat and likely have the skills to make incredibly important decisions when they come up. So if life is going easy for you, it's a great time to take up a challenge because you're, uh, you're in a great state of mind. You're in the ideal state of mind to take up more challenges. So let's just double back to Neverwinter now. What is a very great opportunistic moment to get better at video games? Like, or develop a higher literal value of yourself with accolades. Hope that Cryptic changes the system again next module. Because if you can deal with that in a video game, then when some real stuff hits you, you know, some harder stuff hits you, you've already practiced that. If Cryptic changes something and it makes you change all the ways you have to have to play this game and you run away from it and say, I'm quitting this game and playing a different game, well, that's one of your problem solving skills. How do you solve a problem when people when change the game you love to something you don't love? You walk away from it. You've learned something about yourself. It might not be ideal, but you at least know how to walk away now. You practice walking away from something. It's not negative or positive, per se. The facts are you walked away from it. That's a practice of walking away from things. You might be a lot of times I think people were gonna expect me to say like oh yeah you're running away that's a negative thing well it's a negative and a positive thing you're practicing something you don't do very often uh, when is having the ability to walk away very useful when you are addicted to something and that addiction is killing you when you're doing it for something less likely you're practicing for times when you have to walk away even against a maybe a trivial but a lot of emotional sentimental uh, sentiments right that's that's what I'm talking about preparing preparing people and I think uh, when you're healthy and you're just going about your way life is good that is easily the most opportune moment to take up challenges because when you're in a bad state of mind and life 
has kicked you down and like cut you open and then maybe pour some salt on its wounds at least you'll have some practice some practice where you can gather from your experiences to keep you know make soften the blow and kids aren't really reminded of that these days. The video games are just deliberately telling you what is and what isn't. Not what could be, 